and the coat of many colors from the Old Testament. And I said that Joseph saved the 12 tribes of Israel, which he did. He saved the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, of which he was one. And I said it's ironic that this, these 12 tribes of Israel were saved by a fortune teller. Well, a lady called on the phone. And she said, how dare you say this? And she really took off. She, you know, she was on the answering machine. I, I didn't. She was, a, he wasn't a fortune teller. How could you ever say such? You shouldn't be allowed to say such things. They have to take you off. You're telling such terrible things. And when I, and as I thought about this, the thing that struck me was, it wasn't so much that I said what I said. It, what bothered me so much is the fact that here it is in the Bible, and yet this woman didn't want this to be said. Don't say what's in here if it doesn't agree with what we've made up. Don't, don't confuse me with the truth. Now, she was hot. And, and the reason I thought it would be good if you saw this, if you'll open your Bibles to the book of Genesis and go to page 39 in the first book of the Bible, J, uh, Genesis on page 39. The rest of you go to Genesis 44. Okay. And I want to show you something. Genesis 44. Okay. And this is where I took so much flack about this uh, last night, but I, I, I need to show you something. Genesis 44, and if you go to verse 5. Genesis 44, verse 5. Okay. Well, let's go to Genesis 40, 44, verse 4. When they were going out, Joseph said unto his steward, Follow after the men, and when you overtake them, Say unto them, Where have you rewarded evil for good? Is not this it, that means the silver cup, in which my Lord drinks, and whereby indeed he divineth? You know what a divination is? Divineth? You know what he used to do? That means he would take color liquid, put it in his cup, spin it around, and tell fortunes on the way the colors lined up in the cup. He was a fortune teller. But I, you need to see that. Here is Joseph saying, you've got my silver cup, and this is the one in which I divine it. Say, Look at, at Genesis 44, 15. And Joseph said unto them, what deed is this that you have done? You see Genesis 44, what ye not? That means, isn't that such a man as I can certainly divine? I'm a fortune teller. Now look at, uh, you're in Genesis, go back a few pages to Genesis 41, verse 12. Genesis 41, verse 12. And it says, And there was with us a young man, a Hebrew servant, they're talking about Joseph, and we told him, and he interpreted to us our dream. He's a dream interpreter. You see that? He interpreted dreams, look at this. He interpreted dreams, and he divined the fortune of people by using these colored things in water. That's what he did. Now, let's go to page 647 in the Old Testament. And Jeremiah 29, to the rest of you, okay? The book of Jeremiah, verse 29. Now, here's a guy, Joseph, who saved the 12 tribes of Israel. Here's a guy that has said... He found favor in the eyes of God. He was a fortune teller who used funny stuff in a cup, and he would interpret people's dreams and tell them what to do. And this lady took after me last night because I said this, but you, did you see it in the Bible? Did it say that he divineth and he interprets dreams? Now look at Jeremiah, verse 20. This is the guy that saved all Israel from extermination. On page 647 in Jeremiah 29. You all there? All right, let's go down to verse 8. Look what it says. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. In other words, you had too much pizza, and that's why you had that nightmare last night. <laughs> God didn't like me when I get into the cookies and cream at about 3 o'clock in the morning and get this bizarre dream because the cookies and cream just collided with the uh, lasagna that I had a little earlier, and I got a dream. So what, I'm going to go to some screwball who's going to interpret it for me, and it's all the result of pizza and cookies and cream. But that's not the point. 
The point is, Joseph was a diviner, and he interpreted dreams. And here in Jeremiah, it says, those people are screwballs. But this screwball, Joseph, it said, found pleasure in God's eyes, and he saved the whole tribes of Israel from distinct, extinction. Now, I got hell last night from a lady. How dare you say that? We don't say those things that are in the Bible. We make up things. You know what they do? They take those pages in the Bible that they don't like and <coughs> they rip them out. They never go there. They never look at those things because it spoils their little fantasies. But this guy was whacked out. Joseph was into one of these guys. I was into this. Can you imagine? This is this guy that God blessed. Of all the tribes of Israel, God blessed Joseph. He was in charge of all Egypt. And he had funny stuff in a cup. And he said, they're... Oh, little cup, spinning, spinning, little cup, what's up? And then he would tell you his dream. But Joe, what did he call the king to interpret his dreams? Or he did interpret the yeah. king's dream, if you remember. There were seven mm. fat cows and seven skinny cows. Mm. I can't get into that right now, but you can imagine what that one was. <laughs> okay? But the point is still that, indeed, the 12 tribes of Israel were saved by a fortune teller. And then, of course, I followed up by the little bulletin last night that Jesus was announced by astrologers from Iran. And, you know, it's true. What are you do with it? It's true. Okay, we're at Matthew 21, 18. And here we get to the point of the fig tree. Jesus is going to curse a fig tree. Here he is, Jesus coming. To hit. Let's pretend this is a fig tree. Jesus is hungry. He comes over to the fig tree. What? Hey, listen, I am starving, and this is a fig tree? Give me a break with that. <coughs> Zappo, no more figs for you. Three, croak. We're going to Wawa to get our fig. Come on, boys, let's go to Wawa. Hey, this is the thing. But you know, you're laughing, but that's exactly what every one of you believes. He got so ticked off because he couldn't get what he wanted, he knocked this fig tree right out of its trunk. And, that, and, that, and that's basically what we believe. So we have to think, this is the Prince of Peace. Come on, wake up! Do you hear what I said? Your holy Jesus from Bethlehem, oh, little child of Bethlehem. <laughs> he's going to save the whole world, and one of the great things he's going to do is split this fig tree, because he didn't get fed when he wanted to get fed. Didn't get my way. If I can't get a fig, nobody will get a fig. Figure that one out. <laughs> that just, I added that. <laughs> that was it. All right, let's go back to Matthew 21. It's going to be great. Here we go. Now, what it said in Matthew 21, 17, that's on page 22 of those little bottles, Matthew 21, verse he left them, he went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. And Bethany means the house of dates. Forget him as a person. This is Christ. Bethany means the house of dates because it was filled with what they call date palm trees, which gave shade. In this particular thing, it's telling you that your Christ consciousness, when it comes up against those people, when it comes up against them, when it comes up against your own family and friends who don't understand this, it's going to have to go to Bethany. It's going to have to get to some place where you can get out of the heat of the lower sun, which is trying to burn this stuff out of you. That's what it means. And after that, it said, Matthew 21, 17, in verse 18, now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. Here's the next one. Morning in city. Remember, we're breaking a code of a mystical code. In the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. Now, here he enters into Bethany to be sheltered from that which is the heat of the lower mind. But here comes the morning having found shade, having found a separation from that burning passion, compassion, and all of that stuff of the lower mind, you all of a sudden you come to this place where now, as a result of your meditation, comes morning. Light drives away the darkness, and there is morning. And you know what happened? 
As Jesus says, I am the bright and morning star. When morning comes and the Christ consciousness starts then to build itself back up into you, you've been attacked by your mother-in-law, you've been attacked by your brothers, you've been attacked by your sisters, you've been attacked by people in the church, you've been attacked by people in the society, in the community. They're all telling you you're a cult. They're all telling you better not do this stuff anymore. They're all telling you better get away from this stuff. You've got to get back to the old-time religion and all of these things. And you've hid out from them. You've come to meditation. And then here comes the light. And when the light comes to you, as it said in the morning, suddenly you become hungry. Your spirit is hungry again. Your spirit wants to devour again. Your spirit wants to take into itself again these truths. Your spirit wants to understand these things again. So when Jesus comes into the city, it means when Christ comes into the consciousness, there is now a hunger for you to find out what's going on. We sat here, fr I'll tell you something. Tuesday night we had a meditation in here. And I am reluctant to say these things because, you know, somebody will say, oh, it always happens when I'm not there. And that's not fair. Because I know you can when you, you come, we can. Tuesday night we had a meditation. And at the very end of it, something occurred. We had an encounter. We had a visitation here. And it's not really in my, and I would, you know, it's difficult for me even to talk about it or to discuss it. But this, I can guarantee you, and I know Albert called me when I got home. I no sooner walked in the door than the phone rang that he recognized and he knew what had happened. This is the thing that you've talked about, you've prayed about, you've come to church about, you've got Bibles about, you turn on Christian television about, all of these types of things. And when it begins to happen, Many of us either aren't here, don't recognize it, or are afraid of it. He was here. He, the universal presence, was here and spoke. You can, Albert can fill you in. But it's true. So when Jesus comes into the city, it's that when the activation of the consciousness starts, Christ starts to become active, and when Christ starts to become active in your higher mind, you get hungry. That's why people come out here on Friday nights and say, hey, did you hear what happened here Friday night? The things that we talked about Friday night. Libra. Libra. Did you ever know that there are two stars in Libra? One star is in the lower balance. The other star is in the higher balance. And the star in the lower balance means the price deficient. It's not enough. It's your lower mind. And the star in the higher balance means the price that covers. And the entire Bible is written in that constellation Libra because once you have chosen, once you have weighed, then you turn to the first decon of Libra and you come to the cross, the crucifixion of the five senses. And once you have gone through the crucifixion of the five senses through meditation, you come to the second decon in Libra, which is the victim slain, the animal nature to be slain. And once the animal nature within is slain through meditation, you come to the third decon in the constellation Libra, the crown. It's all there, written in the stars. Written in the stars. And all of the stars carry the names of the thing. This Bible was written in the sky millions of years before it was ever placed on paper. And almost to a person, we have been afraid to look at it. You, me, everybody, we're afraid to look at it, and we don't even know it's there. The entire Holy Bible is written in the sky. So things are happening. Amazing and beautiful things are happening. And Christ has certainly come into that city. The morning means that the light has come, the darkness has fled away, and there is hunger. Now there is hunger. I want to be fed this. In the Buddha, Karida, it says this, there was a city which was the dwelling place of the great Saint Kapila. And the great Saint Kapila is the supreme self. The supreme self is the great Saint Kapila. You! See? Every time, as we get on Friday and we look at another constellation, there is a bright star in the constellation. And when we interpret what the word means in Arabic, it means the branch. Almost in every constellation, there is a bright star called the branch. And everybody immediately thinks that's Jesus. The branch is a prophecy of the coming of Jesus, the branch. But Jesus says, no, I'm the vine. You're the branch. The stars are filled. The sky is filled with bright stars that are you. God placed these tremendous bright stars in each constellation, and he named them you. 
It's your star, Albert. It's your star, Joan. It's your star, Becky. And it's your star, Joan. It's your star, Linda. Up there are your stars. He reserved them for you. He says, I will bring forth the branch. In other words, I will bring forth those who will rise in consciousness, overwhelming that lower flesh, and be a beacon and be a light unto the world. And Jesus Christ said, you are the branch, and you are the light of the world, and that's your star. See, the city is consciousness. That's why in Hebrews 12, 22, it says, You are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God. And when you come into nirvana, when you come into the higher realm of consciousness, you come to the city, you come to the higher mind. So in Matthew 21, 18, the light of Christ becomes active and he becomes hungry. Now remember something. When you talk about hunger, forget food that goes into the mouth. Food that goes into the mouth has, through its journey, a rather unpleasant experience. And it does me little good to stand here and give you an anatomical lesson. How many of you know what happens when food goes into your mouth? Nobody knows. You see what trouble I have here, folks, all over the country. Bill Compton in Louisiana, you see what I go through? Nobody knows what happens. Well, this is what happened. <laughs> Jesus Christ told you what happened, and Jesus Christ said, it is not what you put into your mouth that makes you clean or unclean. It is what comes out of your mouth. Okay. So when it talks about he hungered, it is Christ consciousness within you hungering to devour this information, hungering to find out what life is, hungering to find out what you are, hungering to be allowed to receive this and give this forth to others who would come in to your experience. This is what it says in the Sufi religion of India. Hunger is a cloud which rams, excuse me, hunger is a cloud which rains down wisdom. None can worship rightly if he is not hungry. Ah, hunger is a cloud which rains down wisdom and none can worship if he is not hungry. And I'm afraid there are many of us that are too filled with other stuff. And we can't take another bite. And so we never devour this food. Never devour it. So it says Jesus was hungry. You know, in his own words in Matthew 5, 6, just take a look at it. Page 4 in your little Bible. Keep your finger right where you are. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 6, it says Jesus was hungry in the, in the chapter that we're studying. But look what it says in Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. What does that mean? I had a guy call me on one of these anonymous calls and said, you're saying it's the right hemisphere of the brain. It just means doing right. It doesn't mean anything more than doing right. But the Bible says in Romans 8, 7, it's impossible for you to do right because your mind is not subject to the law of God. I hunger and I thirst after righteousness. I want to be in a right standing. I want to sit at the right hand of power. I want to cast my net to the right side. I want to go through the right door. I want to live on the right side. I want to be in a right standing with God. And I want to zoom up to the zenith of the ramp, sit at the right hand of power that summer may come to my life and that I may share the fruit from the tree with all of those who wander into my yard. Psalm 107, 9 says, For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. So Christ consciousness is active in your mind. You become hungry for higher things, for spiritual things. Okay, let's get to the point. Jesus come to the fig tree. First of all, shame on all of us for thinking that Jesus would harm an innocent living thing. That's the first thing. You know, how stupid are we? How stupid, stupid, stupid are we that we go to school, we go to religious schools, we go to church, we go to Sunday school, and we, we would come in here or come into a church thinking that Jesus would actually harm an innocent living thing and never question it. That right away should give you pause to sit back and say, what the heck am I, who am I listening to? And these same screwballs 
who would tell you that Jesus would harm an innocent thing are now going to tell you that God is going to drop atomic bombs as great Armageddon finale to his book, and he can't change it because he doesn't want his book to come out wrong. He wants to have a bestseller, so his book's got to end right, so it's got to have an atomic explosion. And we listen to it, and we buy it. And they sit on television, and when he tells how God's going to rape the world with atomic warfare, they say, oh, hallelujah, the king is coming. Boom, the king is coming. <laughs> Boom, the king is coming. <laughs> what nonsense. And we love it. Here he comes with his little tanks and his little machine guns to save us all. Jesus. I want to show you something in Matthew 21, 19. Jesus came to the fig tree. Most, I don't know, most of you people have been around here for a long time. Are you with me, Matthew 21, 19? Jesus came to the fig tree. When he saw a fig tree, where did he see the fig tree? In the... There you go. There's the answer. There's the answer. We're going to jump the Bible about four times here, but I want you to see something. Go to page 21 in the New Testament. Okay. What am I? Yeah, page 21. That's the next page. Matthew 21. Verse 8. When Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem, where did Jesus enter? And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Go to page 121 in your little Bibles. The rest of you go to the book of Acts. And go to Acts chapter 9. It's important that you see this. It's very important that you see this. This is Saul who became Paul. Acts chapter 9, verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way. Okay. Go back to the Old Testament, page 601. The rest of you go to the book of Isaiah. Go to Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35, page 601, verse 8. And a high way shall be there, and a way. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. The way is the inner way. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 7, 14, the way is narrow and few find it. Most of you have tried to find your life and to accomplish outside of the way. You've taken another direction. You have not got on the way. When the Apostle Paul was knocked off of his horse in the way, it's the same thing as coming into meditation and finding enlightenment. The word horse in the Bible means wisdom, human understanding. He was knocked off of the human understanding by the horse. His eyes were blinded three days and three nights. The scales fell from his eyes means he had a new life, a resurrected life. He was now enlightened. Now he could see, and it all happened in the way. Everything happens spiritually in the way. It's a new way. It's a narrow way. And the zodiac does not mean zoo, as most people think. The word is zeo comes from the ancient Sanskrit, means the way. The way is meditation. In the book of Hebrews, and this is the last one that you'll have to look at, page 206 in your little Bible, I want to show you something that most people don't understand. Hebrews chapter 10, page 206 in the little Bible, Hebrews chapter 10, go to verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. You know, we sat last night watching the, peop uh, the pictures from Israel at my cousin's house. You know what the big thing is? They're all over there looking for the Holy of Holies. They said it was at the temple, but now it's disappeared and nobody knows where it is. I just thought to myself, you sure don't. Did you see what Paul said? You have authority to enter it. You enter into the holy way, the holy place by this new way, the living way. And if you look at 1 Kings 6, 8 in the Bible, it says that the way, that holy place, is put on the right side of the building. 
So all of this happened in the way where Jesus came to the fig tree. Let's go back to Matthew 21 on page 22 in your little Bibles. Let's go back to the Matthew uh, 21. Jesus comes to the fig tree. It's in the way. He's hungry in the way. He's in spirit. This means he's in your way. When you open yourself to Christ consciousness, Christ consciousness appears within you in the right hemisphere of your brain in that mystical place called the way. There is a door at the right hemisphere of your brain that opens to the way. That's where he is. And so what has happened? You've come here. You've come on your knees in meditation. You've gone, oh, nam mi ho ringe kio, nam mi ho ringe kio. You've listened to the music. You've listened to the sounds. You've purged all of the thoughts out of your mind. The door has swung open to the right side. You've entered into the temple, and you found the way, and Christ is there. And Christ, what? Christ comes, and the first thing within, symbolically, he looks for is your fig tree. Your fig tree. And the reason it's a fig tree is because in mysticism and in reality, a fig blossoms on the inside. When you cut a fig open, its blossoms are inside. That's why the fig is a holy fruit in mysticism. And so Christ comes. Inside of you, this happens. He is hungry. He is hungry. He wants to be fed. And he wants that to come from the figs which are produced within you. You see, let's go to the book of Revelation Page 227, Revelation 2, chapter 7. Let me show you something. This is the tree. Revelation 2, verse 7. He that has an ear, blah, blah, blah. to him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life. This is the tree. This is the tree within you. Good night. This is the tree within you where the figs must blossom and ripen. The tree of life. That tree. That tree. That's the tree that you should eat from. See? That's the higher mind. It's the higher scale than Libra. It's the tree of life. In Genesis 2.17, it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, tree of good and evil, do not eat. That's the lower mind. That's the tree that we've been taken from all of our life. That's the fruit we've been eating from all of our life. And that's why we've spent so much of our time doubled up in agony, doubled up in pain, and literally throwing up because we've been eating the bad fruit. We've been taken from the lower mind. In page 463 of your little Bibles in the book of Psalms, the rest of you, Psalm verse 1, Psalm chapter 1, excuse me, Psalm chapter 1, page 463, it says in verse 3, And he, meaning like the mind, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. This is the tree. This is the tree that Jesus is coming to. This is the tree because you have opened the right side. Christ is active. He's coming to your tree. He's coming to your tree. He's coming to your fig tree to see if there are figs, if there is fruit, the Christ consciousness. You know that word where it says, he shall, verse 3 and Psalm 1, his life that brings forth fruit in his season. In the Upanishads of Hare Krishna, it says, then Brahman says, who are you? And he shall answer, I am a season. And a child of the seasons sprung from the womb of em endless space. The seed of the wife, the light of the year, the self of all that is. What you are, that I am. To bring forth fruit in your season is as you begin to evolve in consciousness to this higher mind, you then begin to bring forth the evolution of the soul. 
So now you have to allow Christ. You have invited Christ. Christ has moved through you. He comes upon this tree. It should be a fig blossoming on the inside. But what, look what it has. Matthew 21. We're back on page 22 in the little bottle. We're almost done. Matthew 20. Where am I? Matthew 22 or 21? Okay, Matthew 21 and verse 19. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it, found nothing on it but leaves, and said, Let no fruit grow on henceforth forever. Look what happened here. Listen to me real carefully. We're just about wrapping this up, okay? Watch this here. Christ is the light of the world. Inside of you, he has found this tree, okay? Christ is the sun, the light of the world. On your tree, he finds nothing but leaves. What do leaves do? They shade you from the sun. You sit in darkness. You can't feel. You are cold. You sit in darkness, and they keep you from the sun. This is in the lower aspect of carnal consciousness, not where you're coming from, but you're right. On the tree of life, Look at something else. Go back to the end of your Bible, the Revelation, the book of Revelation. Here are the leaves that keep out the sun. But look at Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Verse 2. In the midst of the street on either side of the river, the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruit, yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, as Mike says, they collect that which is the sun, that which is light. But these leaves are keeping you in the dark. These leaves are keeping the light from touching you. The trees, the leaves on this lower tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, keep out the light of the Son of God. You know, Wadsworth, did you ever hear William Wadsworth, some kind of poet? They didn't hear him. They never heard of him either. <laughs> you know what he said? Longfellow, I do not. This is what the man said. So if you never heard anything else, take this. Christ's eye pierces through the thick leaves of our secret thoughts. But now Christ's consciousness is active, you see. He comes to the lower tree, and he makes us aware. Is this is what he's saying to you. There's no fruit, see. There's no fruit on your tree. There's nothing blossoming in here. Don't be fooled by the leaves on your tree because they will never bring forth for you good fruit. Don't be fooled by the suggestions that are coming out of your lower mind because they will never produce anything for you that will be beneficial. The fruit may taste good in your mouth. It may feel cool to sit under these leaves. But you are blocking out my light, and that which you take within yourself will become sour. That which you take within yourself will gradually and eventually rot. And so what does he do? He saves you. Listen real close. Don't go, shh, shh, shh. He saves you. You have opened yourself to the Christ in meditation. He has looked at this tree which has been deceiving you and me and hurting you and me all of our lives, producing fruit that has hurt us and poisoned us. And since we now have opened ourselves to his activation in the way, he looks at that bad tree and he says, let no fruit grow on you again. You'll never have to worry about consuming another sour fig. You'll never have to worry about consuming more fruit that will destroy your life and the lives of your family and children because he has come in the way within you and come to that tree which has been hurting you and he has said, let no more fruit grow in that tree. You're saved. Innocent thing. He is 
destroying the destroyer. He is devouring the devourer. The corruption of your mind is purged clean by Christ consciousness. The bad fruit will no longer hurt you because the bad fruit will no longer be on your vine. And that all comes because you opened the door to the right side in the way. And as soon as you do, it stirs. Buddha put it this way. You've been tortured by your five consciousness, your five senses. You haven't been able to see the spirit of the seventh sense. You've been filled with the fears from the memories of the eighth sense. And so you have drilled down through the floor into the ninth. And there's the sleeping serpent. And you have awakened the serpent, the kundalini. And she has started to move. I said she. She has started to move. And she has devoured all that hurts you through the eighth and the seventh and the sixth and the five. And eaten away all of that crud which has hurt and infected our lives. It's the same way of course. It's meditation. The beauty, the saving of meditation. And when you come in and you sit here on a Tuesday or whenever or in your house and you look and you understand that Christ is in there to curse that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that tree of the lower serpent which has produced all of the fruit that has made you sick, the fruit that has made your family sick, fruit that has made you broke, the fruit that has made your life miserable, that that fruit will not burst forth again to deceive you and hurt you. Matthew 7, 18, Jesus said, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. In Matthew 7, 19, he says, trees that don't bring forth good fruit are cut down. And in Matthew 7, 20, he said, by their fruits you shall know them. By their fruit you shall know them. What? Not people, your thoughts. Your thoughts. What's the result of your thoughts? How much trouble have your thoughts gotten you into? How much trouble has your thoughts gotten your family into? By their fruit you shall know them. And if you have been living as all of the rest of us have been, what's this world? You've got, you got people in the desert over there. And they got these big guns aimed at one another. And nobody knows quite sure what for. And there are a bunch of people, and the Iraqi soldiers are over there writing to their mamas, saying, so far, so good. And there's American soldiers writing to their mamas and saying, so far, so good. That American soldier and that Iraqi soldier, if they knew each other, they might be able to go in business together. They don't know. And yet, if some old rump says so, they will pick up guns and squeeze the triggers and kill each other. In Vietnam, 52,000 young boys and girls, I guess, Innumerable numbers of Vietnamese people killed. Nobody even knows where the place is now. Nobody knows where it is. What happened? 19 years, if you're 19, 19 years away, the great planet Uranus and the great Aquarian, the man with the pitcher of water, is swinging in his pendulum up to the seventh house. It's going to change. It is changing. I'm going to read you one last thing. I'm, we are done. Go to page 746 in the Old Testament, and we'll read this together. This is the book of Amos. If you're looking for it, it's right after the book of Andy, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> hey, listen. You're not, going to, you're not going to call me up with an anonymous phone call about that, are you? You wretched cult leader, you! Page 746, Amos 2, chapter 9. Uh, chapter, Amos 2, chapter 9. Amos 2, where in the heck am I? What is it? I'm on page 746. I got the wrong Bible. Good. How am I ever going to find Amos? I should write down the numbers in my book. 
1338. Go to page 1338. No, don't go to 1338. Good night. Excuse me. I, I, I got all carried away. I just want to read this to you and then we're done. Amos chapter 2. <coughs> you all, everybody at Amos? Chapter 2, verse 9. Yet destroyed I the Amorite. The Amorite means it is a symbol of the evil mind. Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them whose height was like the height of the cedars. The lower tree. And he was strong as the oaks, the lower tree. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above. And his roots from beneath. Do you know something? that in the ancient myth of the tree of life, let me show you something, how it looks. This is, this is really interesting. I like this. The tree is like this. If you look at Joseph Campbell, eh, you get the book, Joseph Campbell's book on Occidental mythology, Western mythology. The tree is like this. The roots are like this. The roots are not taken from below. They take from above. And the branches and the leaves are like this. The branches and the leaves are going down. <coughs> the roots are plugged into the higher, and that which is then the fruit is given back down to the earth, that which is below. So here then you see, mystically, you've taken away a Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, from one who would destroy an innocent, beautiful, living thing to that which is the Jesus Christ in the way in your meditation who comes to your tree and destroys that so it will no longer bring forth fruit to hurt you and make you sick. That's what meditation is. And it, how, do we, how do we just sort it all out? Simple. Come, sit, meditate, allow yourself to have the right side opened up to the right side of the temple, and there you will find the way. In that way comes the Christ, and that tree that is producing the leaves that deceive you will be destroyed. And there will be a new tree 